So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar which is making skincare advertising claims. Before I start I want to let you all know that this is being recorded and I will be sending out the recording at the end of the webinar. There's also going to be the chance to answer, ask some questions um, and I'll answer those towards the end. Um, so if you've got any questions as I go through the content feel free to put them in the Q&A box um, and also feel free to use the live chat. If you want to talk to any of the other audience members, want to share any of your experiences um, and discuss anything, um, I'm really happy for you guys to kind of talk as well on there. Um, so try and you know keep it interactive. Let's all have some fun today. Um, and as I said, I'll be answering those questions towards the end as well. Um, so basically, we're going to look at specifically skincare today. So a lot of my webinars are either very, very broad in terms of the cosmetics industry or very, very niche in terms of really specific trends. And actually, um, the majority of our work, uh, substantiating claims, at in global research, is all about skincare. Um, it's one of the most innovative parts of the cosmetic industry. It's where you see the most claims. Um, so actually, I thought it was really important to touch on it specifically today. Um, so just to go through the agenda, I'll be looking at an overview of the global skincare industry, um, just to kind of set our minds in the right space. Uh, we'll be talking about regulations for advertising in general as well. Um, so we'll look at specifically um, skincare and cosmetic um, regulations, but also what you need to be aware of just generally. Um, we'll be looking at substantiating those claims and what methods we can use. Um, so to do that, I'll share some case studies, which will go through the study designs that we would recommend um, for different claims and different product types. Um, and also I'll be looking at how you can then use that data in your marketing um, to make sure that you're getting the most out of it as well. So lots to cover today, um, but I think it's all going to be really interesting. So for those of you who don't know me as well, I'm the Regulatory Director at Aiton Global Research. So as I said, we specialise in substantiating advertising claims for any kind of um, FMCG category, but the majority of it really is cosmetics because that's just where you see the most advertising claims. It's a hugely congested market um, with lots and lots of products out there. So it's always exciting. There's always new trends. So I'm really focusing on advertising regulations because obviously we need to make sure that our clients' data is going to be compliant um, for the main territories and platforms um, and for the claims that they want to say about their products as well. So that's really what I'm focusing on in particular. Um, and from that, I get a lot of um, information as well about cosmetic regulations, of course. Um, so really, I'm your go to person. If you've got any kind of upcoming studies or have any products that you'd like to get claims substantiated on, and then we can review how it's best to do that. So just to kind of put our skincare hats on, um, why do we want to talk about skincare in particular? Well, as I said, it's a huge, huge part of the uh, cosmetics industry. Um, so I've got a few bits uh, from some market research websites as well, because it's always nice to get some kind of stats and data and see why are we talking about it so much. So um, interestingly, um, Statista, they're saying that they're seeing a shift in demand from older customers to a growing younger consumer base as well. Um, so it's just an interesting thing to think about when we're thinking about skincare. It's kind of all ages now where it used to be um, people would go, OK, get a certain age, you to use my anti-aging products. A lot of a younger consumer now is realizing that using it at a younger age is actually going to be how you're best to use your skincare routine anyway. Um, so even teenagers are starting to get into skincare, whereas I know when I was a teenager, it probably was the last thing on my mind. It was more to do with the makeup side of things. Um, so it's it's in, basically it's such a broad, broad category now. Um, so it really is the fastest growing in the whole of the cosmetics industry. Um, there's an interest to kind of people just adapting their marketing strategies as well. We're seeing a lot more go on to things like social media, because obviously that's the best way to communicate with a younger audience. And I will actually be showing some examples of that later as well. So you can get an idea of how you can do that. Also, Mordor Intelligence, um, they've got some information about what's going on in the skincare category. Um, generally, it's kind of encompassing everything. So I'll be talking a lot about facial skincare, but it includes things like body care and sun protection as well. Brands like Sephora, Kills, Vici and Bobby Brown are also looking at things like virtual advisors to adapt to the current climate of COVID-19. So I can't get through a webinar without bringing it up, but it's always going to be the case. Um, but no, absolutely. So it, it's something that the, the industry is really adapting around to make sure you can get that kind of um, consultancy 
directly still because skincare is so um, specific to different skin types and everything like that. So it's really important that consumers can still understand how they can get the help of what to choose, really. And it makes it even more important than ever to make sure we have some great substantiated claims on our products um, so that people know to buy it, even if they're looking online or something like that. And there's also this really great image from Mordor Intelligence as well, just to give us a real broad overview of the um, the the market for skincare as well. Uh, so Asia Pacific is the largest and the fastest growing market. Um, so I'll be looking at a case study for Asia as well to give you an idea of that because it's a really great way to be placing your studies there. Huge consumer base, um, but also it might be the way you're looking at producing your products as well. The key players in the game are, unsurprisingly, um, really good household names that we all know about, Unilever, L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, Bierstorff and Shiseido. They are your kind of main um, competition, essentially, when we're looking at who is the huge, um, who, who are the huge leaders in the skincare category. So that's kind of given us our overview about why we're talking about skincare, why is it so important? And I want to talk about claims in general. Now, this all might seem really obvious, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. When I talk about advertising claims, we all know what exactly I am talking about. Um, so an advertising claim is anything that's used to market your product. So anything that describes the effect and it can be used on any single platform. Um, so it could be TV, could be on a website, could be social media could be absolutely anywhere on your packaging. Um, they would help the consumer choose a product. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to let our consumers know if you have dry skin, this is really good for dry skin. If you've got wrinkles, this will get rid of your wrinkles. If you want a nice, bright, bold lip, this will get you a bright, bold lip. That is what we're looking at communicating. Um, but obviously, we need to have some substance behind what we're saying. And that's what we'll be talking about mainly today. It'll also help you stand out in a crowded market and against your competition. So as well as just letting our consumers know what our product does we want to use our advertising claims to make sure that we are the brand that people will choose as we mentioned it's a huge category there are so many brands out here all trying to sell very similar things there's one trend and an ingredient everyone's on the bandwagon but why should they choose your product that is what we're trying to do um, so as you can see i've got some little examples from different platforms across the page here um, about kind of claims that are used in advertising as well but we'll go into those in more detail later on so when we're talking about advertising claims then, who is actually regulating them? So let's talk about the, the boring bit, if you will, the regulation, the compliance, um, before we get into how we actually substantiate them. Because although I say it's the boring bit, only because I talk about this every single day of my life, um, it's most important because there's no point doing these advertising claims and having these wonderful products and saying these things about it if your advert is incompliant and you just get it taken down anyway. So who is regulating these? Now, for most countries, um, there is a advertising authority that will not just regulate cosmetics or skincare, but they're regulating every single product that's on the market at all. So that's our starting point. When we're thinking about advertising, we need to make sure, first and foremost, we are complying with their regulations um, because that's who, you know, that's who's regulating everything. So generally it's done through self-regulation. What does this mean? Well, it means that you as a brand are responsible to regulate yourself rather than kind of having someone review all your adverts for you and making sure that they are compliant. It's really your responsibility. So it makes things a bit easier because as I said, so many products coming out every day. Uh, we need to make sure that, you know, everything's, uh, it's up to you as a person responsibly. Um, so basically it's really done on a complaints basis. So you would look at your local advertising authority. There's a different one for every country. Um, so let's use the UK, for example, just because I'm based here. Um, for the UK, you'd be looking at the Advertising Standards Authority, going on their website and going, OK, what is their code of conduct? What are the general rules that I need to um, uh, uh, com um, comply with to make sure my advert's going to be allowed? Um, once following that, it's kind of worked on, it works on a complaints basis. So it could be a consumer uh, purchases your anti-wrinkle cream and finds that they have seen no effect whatsoever. And they might go to their um, local advertising authority and say, look, this doesn't work. I don't believe what they're saying. That authority would then come and have a look at your evidence. If it's um, all good, they'll be like, no, that's fine. It's just a odd person that hasn't had the effect they want. But generally, we can see it works. Or they'll go, OK, you haven't got enough evidence behind this claim. 
you need to remove the advert. Um, in some cases, it could be as bad as a product recall, because obviously if you have it printed all over your packaging, um, you're not gonna be able to just take it down. Um, and if you don't comply with them, then trade, or, trade commissions uh, do get involved as well. So it can go to a legal side. Um, if it could also be your consumer, so uh, your competitor, sorry, could also see your claims. Um, so we've had people come to us before and say, oh, why can't you substantiate that claim for us because so-and-so is saying it? Uh, and it's kind of like, well, it doesn't mean that they should be saying it necessarily. Um, so actually, I always say to people, if you want to complain about them, you are very welcome to. That is what your advertising authority is for. If you feel like your comp competition is being unfair and saying things that aren't true or unsubstantiated about their products, that's what this platform is for. Um, and then they can investigate it on your behalf and um, make sure that it's fair, really. That's what we want to do. We want to make sure that the kind of global advertising playing field is fair playing field. Um, so that's really what happens there. There are some kind of exceptions. You've got things like in the USA, you've got the Federal Trade Commission. So that's not self-regulation, that is a federal agency. And instead of just taking down your adverts, you do th see things like class action lawsuits. So let's be super careful when we're advertising in the USA. Um, and it's same with the UAE as well. They've also got um, a federal kind of organization looking at things. But generally self-ad regulation is the way to go and it's really your responsibility. Um, so do have a look at these sources that, um, that I've put on there as well. There's the International Chamber of Commerce and they have a framework countries adopt. So generally there's 52 countries that use that at the moment. Um, you can kind of tell they'll all be saying the same kind of thing. Um, so that's really helpful. Uh, and also ICAS, which is the International Council of Ad Self-Regulation. You can have a look at the members on there as well and just make sure wherever you're advertising, you're looking at the right advertising codes. They're pretty straightforward, to be honest, um, but it is really worth. There is odd countries that have slightly different things, um, slightly different codes in there, especially when we're looking at cultural aspects as well and not offending people. Um, so, yeah, it's really worth taking a look. But that's our really broad overview. Like I said, before you even think about making any advertising claim, you wanna look at the advertising authority first. So what's the advertising authority saying about cosmetics in the UK? As I said, generally it's quite broad, but they do have some specific advice as well. So like I said, I've just used the UK for now because every country's got some and it would take me all day if I was gonna go through examples. Um, but generally they're all kind of saying the same thing, no matter what country you go to anyway. So um, the ASA say you must hold appropriate and adequate scientific evidence to substantiate an efficacy claim, whether explicit or implied. So implied claims are also things that can trip people up. Um, so make sure that anything you're putting across in your messaging, whether you're saying it is uh, hydrating or you just have an image of a woman getting kind of water thrown in her face and going, go it's so hydrating i'm really bad at advertising by the way i'm more about the regulation side so don't get me to make your advert get me to substantiate it um but they they basically you're implying uh, that the product's having a hydrating effect so it still needs to be substantiated um so the key is obviously to focus on the cosmetic effect um the product the consumers are going to get um and if it goes beyond a simple cosmetic effect it needs to have robust evidence again we're laboring the point we need to have evidence behind these claims um things like um Time point claims as well we need to have um, culminative, um, culminative studies with different time points. So again, this is all quite obvious, but the ASA is saying they in particular are going to look at this. You're saying a time point, you need to show that it's having a culminative effect, so you need to have some evidence which shows that. Be careful you don't make a medicinal claim. That's, again, a really um, broad global thing. Um, so certain products, cosmetics can be um, kind of dipping their toe in the medicinal land and you can't do that because you have to go through in the UK or EU a whole different registration to have your product as a medicine than you do to have your product as a cosmetic. Examples of this, if you've got a moisturizer, you cannot say that it helps um, to prevent the uh, symptoms of eczema because that's a medical condition. Um, but what you can do is have a secondary claim that says, oh, it may also be suitable for those with eczema. So be really careful not to make a medicinal claim. It's something we see a lot in the wellness industry. So kind of cosmetics for wellness can start to go that way. Something we saw a lot with CBD. We need to be really, really cautious. Um, so that's always a really good thing to always have in your head as well. Well, this is a cosmetic, it's not a medicine, um, because that can be a whole mess if you go down that route. 
Um, the product itself as well, um, the name of the product sorry, itself could also be a claim. Um, so also be careful of that. Again, it could be anti-aging day cream. Well, you need to have some evidence behind that claim. It's in the name. Um, so always think about these things. Every, everything could be a claim essentially. So always be really cautious. So we've got our kind of advertising authorities then. Now, specifically to cosmetics, what's happening there? Um, so obviously, again, this is EU and UK based, but the, every country has their own um, cosmetics regulations. But I find this a really good guide, no matter what brand I'm working with in which country, um, just to have these six common criteria for cosmetic claims. It's, it's going to apply everywhere. Um, so these are really, really helpful. Um, so basically, as I said, the cosmetics regulation also has things about claims. So, you know, if you're registering your product in a certain country, you need to um, you need to comply with their regulation. Um, so there's usually some information about claims there. But yeah, the six common criteria in the EU one is incredibly helpful. So to break them down, we've got legal compliance. Your product must be legally compliant. Um, you can't sell it if it's not legally compliant. Um, so we need to make sure that we're not using that as a claim. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting one that really goes, because um, you see from the image, the free from claims as well. So saying things uh, like paraben free, it can suggest that um, it's not, you know, it's damaging to have parabens in them, but actually parabens are legally compliant. Um, so we can't really use things that are to do with compliance um, about our advertising claims. Now that is a kind of EU, UK specific one because a lot of countries, especially the US for example, love their free from claims and it's still really popular. Um, but obviously again, if you're looking at having claims that go across multiple territories, you need to know about these regulations. Um, so really important to keep your ear to the ground. Um, your product must be truthful. So you can't say um, that it's um, kind of got a soothing aloe vera in it if it didn't have any aloe vera in it or if it's got such a low percentage of aloe vera that it's not going to have um, the effects of that um, ingredient so we need to be really really truthful about what's actually you know what our product can actually deliver you need to have evidential support i won't labor that too much because that is going to be this whole <laughs> the whole webinar is all about making um, claims substantiated so i'm going to go into some case studies for that later you need to be honest. Um, so you couldn't say uh, the, um, you know, a million customers love this product. Uh, say if you'd only sold a million units, but you hadn't actually had a million customers, um, because obviously that's going to be um, not honest. It's not an honest representation of what you've actually achieved. Uh, it needs to be fair. So as I said, it's all about being fair against your competition as well. Um, so make sure that, for example, if you're doing a comparative claim, it's like for like. So the example I always use is if you had an anti-dandruff shampoo and you're going to say it reduces you know, more flakes than this shampoo, the other shampoo has to be anti-dandruff. If it doesn't have any anti-dandruff properties, then it's not really fair on the competition there. Um, so always be very fair when you're making comparison claims. Um, and essentially, your consumer needs to be able to make an informed decision about purchasing your product. So that's what we're using the claims for. They need to understand what the claims are doing. So if you're kind of being in any way a bit ambiguous about the product or the claims, they can't make an informed decision about it. So that's what we need to be careful of. And in particular, again, EU, UK, but a lot of other countries as well have the same responsible person process. That is the person who is responsible for the claims. So if you are a responsible person, you need to be aware of this because it comes down to you. Um, and also, I know a lot of brands um, have come to us because they've had to get a new responsible person. For example, if they uh, had a UK one, I need EU, vice versa. Um, obviously, these claims are getting reviewed again because we need to make sure that the evidence is compliant. Um, so you're coming under further scrutiny. But yes, it's really up to the responsible person. Sorry, we've looked at our um, all of our kind of regulation side. That's all part. So we know cosmetics regulation, advertising regulation. There are two main ones when it comes to claims. So let's make sure we've got those covered. Now we want to think about what kind of claims we can actually make. So the Cosmetics, Toiletry and Perfumery Association, or the CTPA, um, have come up with a lovely breakdown of the different kind of claims um, categories, if you like, um, that we can look at when we're looking at cosmetics and indeed skincare. Um, so I like the breakdown here. Um, and again, it makes you think about what kind of evidence can be used for what kind of claim as well. So sensory claims, um, anything to do with the uh, look and feel of the product, the fragrance, 
product aesthetics is very similar, but also includes the packaging as well. Um, so yeah, anything that kind of comes from those initial reactions, sensory reactions to the product. The performance, very straightforward. Does the product actually perform? Also known as efficacy claims. Is it efficacious, the product? Does it work? Um, ingredient claims, I mentioned this earlier. Does it have this level of ingredient in it? What does the ingredient do? Combination claims, this is quite um, common for things like hair care, where you say um, this conditioner works best, at best when used with this shampoo. Well, we can't just say that. We need to have some evidence that the effects are very good when used together. Comparison claims. Um, so again, I mentioned that earlier, you can compare different products. Um, you can also compare your own products. So new and improved formula can come from a comparison study. Um, so yeah, we wanna have some comparison claims in there as well. Subjective claims, anything um, that is very opinion based, it can't be proved by science. I would buy this product. Um, this is the best product I've ever used. This kind of thing, um, you can't measure that. It has to be someone's opinion only. And objective claims, very much the obvious. It's not opinion, it's just science. Um, so we see there's things like 50% um, re reduction in wrinkles. That's an objective fact and needs some objective evidence behind it as well. So they're kind of our main breakdown we're thinking of claims um, as a whole. Um, and then we can kind of break that down in each kind of category. So then we want to think about, okay, we've got our main kind of claims, but how do we find a relevant claim for my product type? I've just seen a spelling mistake in formulation, so I do apologize, <laughs> but you want to start with the formulation of the product. Um, so that's really, whenever anyone comes to me and they say, right, I've got a day cream that I want to get some claims substantiated for. What do I need to say about it? Um, what can I say about it? Well, start with your formulation. What can the product do? It's no good me giving you recommendations about the claims. I didn't make the product. I don't know what your kind of target is. So always start with the formulation. What is it? Why have you made the product? What has all the ingredients do together? What does that kind of uh, mixed substance expect to deliver? So that's what we're starting with when we're finding a relevant claim to our product. Then we need to think about our target group. So we need to fully understand what their needs are, and then we can really understand what was really relevant. So how do we do that? We can do things like qualitative or quantitative research, things like focus groups, market research. You can look at what your customers are saying. So if you already have some products on the market, what are your customers looking for? What are their needs with the product? Uh, what are the product experiences that you have? What have you noticed about your products that could be improved? What can you not find on the market that you wish was there? Um, and also look at a comparison with competition. So as I said, what are your competitors saying about their brands? Can you say something better? Do you want to say similar things? Uh, really look at your competitors as well. And check your competitors' successes and failures. Successes are always great. Why is that product the best selling? What are they saying about it that we are not saying? What evidence do they have that we don't have? And looking at that and then failures as well is such a huge thing when it comes to claims. Um, I love the Advertising Standards Authority um, cases. I always um, subscribe to their newsletter so I can see new cases coming at the time. What has got pulled up for being uncompliant as a claim? Um, so keep an eye on that as well, because before you get on a rabbit hole and go, oh, why is no one saying this about their product? This is such an amazing claim. It will really sell. Um, it could be because you're not allowed to, quite simply. Um, so look at the failures as well as the successes. So then how do you make an effective claim? We've thought about what's relevant now, how do we make it really effective? So it's kind of a wheel uh, that we want to think about that'll make it really strong. So what's in it for the consumer? Always think about that before you go down a rabbit hole, as I say, it might be that you found the best um, you know, skincare product that's so innovative at doing something in particular, um, but actually the consumers don't really want it. So what's the point? Um, so we really think about what's in it for the consumer. But then we need to think about as well what it can actually deliver. Um, so it's all very well and good, again, having an amazing claim. But if your formulation can't deliver that, you're not going to live up to it and you're not going to get the claim substantiated. Does it support your brand as well? So as well as thinking about what it can do, what it can deliver, what is your brand overall? Because having a strong brand is still really important as well. Um, instead of just having different products that deliver different things, you want to think about your overall image. Think about your sales. Can it be implemented? Can you actually deliver these um, things with your sales strategy as well? So think about how you can actually make the sales. Can you make profit from it um, and everything like that? 
And is it legally supported? So again, you need to make sure that you have some evidence behind these claims. So it's all very well and good getting these amazing innovative things, but you need to make sure you can get some evidence behind it. So how do we get the evidence? We're going down this kind of journey now, as you can see. We found our relevant claim, we found our strong claim, and we need to now support it with some evidence. So what methods are we going to use to substantiate it? So there's clinical claim substantiation is one side. Um, and what does that mean? Well, there's three methods. There's in vivo, ex vivo, and in vitro. I'm just gonna concentrate on in vivo, but it's uh, the Latin terms. In vivo basically means on a subject, on a person. Ex vivo is on a person's kind of biological makeup, but outside of the human. So think hair tresses, if you're doing some um, kind of uh, research there. And in vitro, which is something um, that is not kind of of a human, but is also in a lab situation. So again, let's um, look at kind of companies that do things like safety testing, which is uh, vegan. So they kind of have replicate of skin, and then they're able to look at those, um, how to substantiate those claims. But in vivo clinical testing is most common if we're looking at claim substantiation. Um, so basically means that it's using an instrument or a biochemical technique to analyze um, the effect of a product. You're looking at objective data here. So as I mentioned earlier, it's usually a measurement. It's something that's not opinion based. It could be things like wrinkle depth, water retention, that kind of thing. Um, and it's to support the performance and ingredient claims. Um, there's lots of standard techniques. Um, so when it comes to clinical, there's usually quite set techniques for certain kinds of claims. Um, and that's kind of what we'll go for there. Uh, and then we're looking at kind of making sure they're blinded as well. So it's generally um, blinded studies. It's the same for consumer research, which I'll talk about next, um, which is looking at removing bias from the claim as well. So it's quite simple. Usually it's a kind of dermatologist or something like that, looking at um, analyzing the skin effect. So it's nothing to do with opinion. It's all to do with the science behind the product. Then we've got consumer claim substantiation, which is what we specialize in at and Global Research. And it's more to do with that, the, the consumer. What does the consumer perceive about the product? What do they like about it? So we you know, sometimes have to have a bit of both, a bit of scientific and a bit of consumer um, to make sure that we've got that objective evidence as well. But this is where you get the kind of true feedback about what your product, um, what, what your consumers think about your product. Um, but also a really great way about delivering that marketing then, because as I said, what do your consumers want? How do you actually tell them what they want? How do you get that across to them? And by getting consumers to analyze products, it's a really good way of getting those claims substantiated. So in-home studies is generally what we're looking at conducting. Um, so we send the product to volunteers to test at home. They answer an online questionnaire. This reflects the actual conditions of the product in use. That is what a consumer study is trying to do. We're going, instead of it being a dermatologist applying the product and going, okay, 50% reduction in wrinkles, that's all very well and good, but that's not going to happen when you sell your products. A consumer is going to pick it up off the shelf or buy it online, look at those claims, use it as you've told them to use it, and we want to make sure that those claims are going to be noticed and perceived by that participant. Um, so they're, they're looking at the efficacy of the product, giving their subjective opinion about it. Uh, and they could also be comparing products as well. So as we mentioned earlier, things like combined claims, comparison claims, these can all be done through consumer research as well. Um, so yeah, we're getting that really good reflection of actual use. Advantages of this. So why do we want to go down the consumer research route? Well, it gives us a fast response time. It's much cheaper than clinical studies. The main reason for that is because they can have a simultaneous validation of several claims, whereas an instrumental study will go, okay, we've got one particular test for wrinkles, one particular test for water retention. Obviously, we can send out a product to a volunteer and they can say, oh, okay, I can analyze all of these claims in, in one sitting because I'm looking at it myself. Um, as we mentioned, it's reflecting the actual conditions of product in use, but actually the most important thing about that as well is undesirable events, because we want to make sure that if we were going to put our product out to a large amount of people, um, we're also going to get any kind of irritations recorded as well when they use it as they're actually supposed to. Uh, you can target a wide range of consumers. Um, so again, it could be different skin tones you want to look at, different skin types, it could be different hair types, curl types. Um, it could be anything. It could be as the shoppers, you know, it's everything that we want to um, everything that you want to look at specifically for your consumer because we're sending them, you know, nationally or internationally. 
Um, on that note of internationally, it can be across multiple countries. So if you have three very key markets, the USA, Europe, and Asia, we can select three countries that replicate that and make sure you're getting feedback from all of your key consumers different languages as well because it's very important when we're selling our products that the language of our claim is verbatim to the you know the, the research data we have and you can also gather other marketing materials as well so things like before and after photos video testimonials written testimonials um, they're all things that you want to get and at the end of the day it's not just about substantiating claims it is getting that really valuable feedback about your product so you know, will it sell and do our consumers like it? Um, and alongside that, we can then get the evidence substantiated. So it's all very good and um, well talking about these things hypothetically, but I think case study is the best way to go. Right, we've got our claims. How do we actually substantiate them? So I'm going to go through two case studies today. The first one I want to talk about is a collagen day cream from a luxury brand. And the reason they want to test their product is to look at the product appeal and suitability for Asian skin in their key Asian markets. Um, they want to make sure their substantiated claims. So we had substantiated claims in the UK and EU for them um, and the USA, actually. But we wanted to make sure that they were then going to do the same performance in Asia because it wouldn't be very fair um, on different climates, different skin types, different culture to assume that the product's going to have the same acceptability. Um, they also wanted to to make sure they had testimonials in local languages so they could use them in their marketing as well. So what was our panel criteria? Well, we had females because that is their key market, that their key consumer, sorry, 30 to 55 years old, all skin types, so everything from dry to oily. Um, we wanted to split it across their key Asian territories, so China, Japan and South Korea and show um, signs of aging as well, because that's what they're going to analyze claim wise and the performance claims. So they need to have fine lines and skin lacking in hydration. And what were the test conditions? So they had to use the product every morning for four weeks, apply on cleansed skin. Um, so again, this is because we're replicating the actual use. So we need to make sure that we have got the same um, usage directions and everything like that, that we would expect them to use at home. We need to make sure we've got safety precautions in line with cosmetic vigilance as well. As I mentioned, this is a great way of tracking um, undesirable events. What were the results then? Um, so we sent out the product for those people to test across those three countries. They answered an online questionnaire in their local language. Um, and this is the kind of translated claims, um, a, a selection of claims that I wanted to pick out um, for you specific for their skincare products. They're all skincare claims. Um, and they're all things that we've managed to substantiate through consumer research data, as mentioned. So this is coming from our report. We have a summary at the end, um, which just shows all of the questions um, on the left hand side, the number of people that had a satisfied response, number of people that were not satisfied and the percentages as well. And this is how we lift out our claims. So this is what you see in uh, marketing. You'd say 93 percent of 100 and oh, I haven't added this up just beforehand. 159 people um, said that the product had left their skin feeling more hydrated. So this is where you really see that in the marketing. 92 percent left their skin feeling soft and smooth. 80% um, of people, sorry, said their skin looked healthy and 88% said it layered well with other skincare products. Um, so again, this is all things that only a consumer can analyze. They can only say, you know, this is all stuff that's really subjective to them. So how do claims then go into the marketing side? Um, because again, it's everyone kind of says to me, you know, hey, I've got my claims substantiated, now where can I use them? Well, you can use them everywhere. This is the whole point. It can go on your packaging, it can go on TV, it can go on your social media. So I've got some examples of brands that have used their data really well in their advertising. So this is the Elemis Pro Collagen Marine Cream. You can see on their website, they've got um, things about, you know, before and after photos, clinical evidence, as well as consumer evidence, which is great. They've got it on their Instagram. And I actually want to show you, uh, if I just share my other screen, their um, clip on QVC, because again, that's a really popular way of um, advertising products as well. So I'll just play this really quick clip for you, which will show you how people can use their consumer data on shopping channels. Is 
a daytime moisturizer that is so whisper light in the texture, but take a look at the improvement in the skin, the heavyweight hydration, 95% agree that it left their skin looking and feeling firmer. 95% of the women and so over 120 women agree that it dramatically reduced the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. But this is my favorite, Jane, because 95% agreed that this anti-aging moisturizer made them fall back in love with wow. their skin again. That is lovely. Now, what I also <laughs> so as you can see they do a lovely job of looking at that um sorry i need to turn my screen again um they do a lovely job of looking at the the claims of the consumer research survey and really boosting that um to make what they're saying as part of their you know um their, their sales pitch substance sub substantiated as well um so it's a really great example of how you can use it there uh, Temple Spa, again, I wanted to use an ex as, as an example um, because they use testimonials alongside their, um, their consumer claims as well. Um, so things about having a radiant glow, skin being soft, smoothed, hydrated and balanced, lovely skincare claims. Uh, and also across social media again. Um, so we've got a, on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, so you can see, again, it, it's, it's a great way of getting your product benefits out there. Um, and Ren, Ren Skincare, again, across um, all of their website and their social media. And this is about things like dark circles. So you can see skincare again, there are so many claims and it just really helps it jump off the page when you can see that um, data being displayed as well. Um, I want to look at another case study as well, something a little bit different um, when we're looking at skincare, because this is more to do um, with appealing to the appearance of skin tones as well, um, instead of just the kind of efficacy claims that's to the performance. So this is the beauty brand we worked with that was looking at a mineral sunscreen, and they wanted to assess how the product worked across a range of skin tones and undertones and evaluate those marketing claims that will support the final product. So the reason for this is because um, you know, the sun creams can kind of have that claggy white sheen that comes across um, and they want to make sure they don't get that on all skin tones because there's no point saying it doesn't have that if you haven't assessed every single skin color. So we looked at a 90% female and 10% male panel because again, their main target is females, but they do want, they don't want to exclude males from the study. They want to be inclusive. <clears throat> It's 18 to 35 years old because that's their target consumer again. They have to use a mineral sunscreen already because we want to make sure that there's something they're used to putting on their skin um, because we're not assessing how it all kind of affected that way. We just want to assess this um, tone. We had a different split of skin types, so oily, normal combination, dry and sensitive. We had an equal split of the Fitzpatrick scale skin tones. So that's our best way of assessing different skin tones is by the Fitzpatrick scale because it helps us include all ethnicities, um, but across obviously darker skin tones to lighter. And then we did an even split again of undertones. So cool, warm and neutral undertones. So we had to have a very big study here of over 300 people to make sure we could cover all of these aspects. So the test conditions, again, is just a one day study because we're just looking at this initial appearance. Um, we wanted to look at um, the, sorry, the usage directions, again, is going to reflect what's on the pack. Um, the restrictions for users not to use it in place of their SPF because it hasn't actually passed the SPF testing at this point. It is the prototype to make sure, um, again, we're looking at the, the, the kind of aesthetic on the skin rather than looking at the performance of the product. So what were the results here? Um, so 80% of people said it did not leave a white cast across their skin. 88% of people said it was suitable for their skin tone. Um, 82 said it was a, gave them a healthy looking glow. And 90% said it felt comfortable to wear on their skin all day. So again, these are really initial assessments of this product, but it shows how important it is now. They can go, well, 80% is a very vast majority of people. So we can be really, really confident that if we can continue with progressing with this product, that we're going to be able to appeal to a really diverse range of consumers. On that note, the legislation side is always the power, never, never very fun and exciting. But I think this is really important. Now, this comes from the ASA. Um, I actually found this, I did a panel webinar not long ago about panel sizes, because it's something we get asked a lot, which is very specific. Um, but this came out of that webinar as well. Now, the ASA um, <clears throat> basically say, that a product should be representative. So if you're going to make a claim about a product being suitable for all skin tones, 
you need to have evidence to say it is suitable for skin tones. So the way they've said it is making a claim, whether direct or implied, about the general population um, needs to be representative of the general population, essentially. So you can't kind of just do um, sort of a couple of skin tones and go, well, it's probably going to work on everyone. It's not going to be fair. And you would have to then state that in your um, evidence. Uh, we also see this a lot where people go, OK, well, can I just use um, my brand users to be part of the study? You can, but that's not the general population. You need to state that in your advertising. So if you're looking at any specific um, kind of, if you're looking at being quite specific with your claim substantiation, that's fine, but you must put it into your headline claim. So, you know, when you say percentage of people agreed in a consumer study, it should say percentage of people who are such and such shoppers agreed um, with the statement as well. And you can't kind of just put it into the small print. So it's a really interesting thing to think about when you're looking at that study design, Think about who is your target audience. Do you want to be specific to people or do you want to have a kind of general claim as well? Um, so before I get to QA, I can see some questions coming in. So I'm excited, Flo. Um, but the other kind of thing, just to look at, we've had some lovely successful cases, but there's also the case of things being tripped up. And I would just bring these up because as we mentioned at the beginning, these are our huge players in the skincare game, Birstorf, S.A. Lorde, Unilever, and they still get tripped up by making um, kind of unsubstantiated or misleading claims. Um, so S.A. Lorde got into hot water this year um, about basically saying that a product Product, um, had a redu reduction in wrinkles um, over four weeks. And they couldn't provide any proof behind those claims. They didn't have the evidence to substantiate it. So we need to make sure, again, that we've got all of that evidence ready when required. Um, Nivea got in trouble um, saying long lasting care on their no nourishing body lotion that was in South Africa. So again, they didn't have the evidence behind the claim. And this was a big one this year um, because microbiome claims are really coming into the fold. And Unilever got in hot water again for having insufficient evidence. Uh, and because it's such a new trending claim, it was just, you know, it was a real um, situation where they thought they kind of could say it, but there's just not enough information about it. So even the big players can get tripped up, be very cautious. And essentially this is what happens. It goes across all the news um, and you can get your kind of drag through, drag through the mud a bit with your brand. You don't want to have any kind of bad reputation out there about your claims as well. So oh, just to summarize before we get to Q&A. <laughs> so it is essential to use advertising claims to stand out against your competition. So if you've come away thinking, oh God, substantiation seems really hard. I don't think I'll bother. I'll just not say any claims. Well, there's no point really selling a product if you haven't got claims about it, because why would people choose your product? You need to have a well-designed study and questionnaire to have that valuable data. Don't get tripped up with health or medicinal claims when you're looking at your cosmetics as well. <clears throat> Make sure your data is compliant in the country you're selling. And as I said, get that valuable feedback from them as well. Always present your evidence clearly in advertising um, and always use recent evidence as well. That's another thing. Formulations really change over time. There are ingredients that change. Make sure to refresh your evidence when you're using it in your advertising as well. So up to q and I've got some questions coming in. Um, so that's really exciting. So let's see what we've got. So I've got a few. Well, everyone's anonymous today. That's fine. Um, so does an aromatic product name fall under implied claim, e.g. calming body butter? Would this calming by aromatherapy require substantiation by a user test? Now, aromatherapy claims are always quite interesting. Um, basically, something like calming, um, if you've got an ingredient that has got a substantiation behind it, um, you can kind of say that but generally, aromatherapy is quite an interesting one because there's not that much substance behind what things are said. They're really kind of based on, oh, well, everyone knows lavender is really calming. Um, I basically always recommend to get substantiation about your product anyway. Even if you're going to use ingredient claims, it gets to a certain point where actually you need to assess that final product and say, does it do what I'm trying to say? And you should get that feedback from those consumers as well. Um, I always think it's a really nice, like I said, it's all about getting that feedback. Does this product make you feel calm? And then what else can you say about it instead of just calming? So there is a kind of thing where you could say it and it could maybe not come into scrutiny because it's kind of like, oh, it's got lavender. Everyone knows it's calming. It's not really too, too worryable. Um, but then, you know, what else can you say about your product? Because that's not a lot of, to say about it. Sorry, I'm really bad at answering questions in a succinct way. I hope that has kind of answered your question, though. So you might get away with it, but I would always recommend a user test. 
Um, so what percentage of positive responses in a consumer use test would be considered a threshold is significant enough to qualify as substantiation? Um, again, I always forget to answer this one. I get this question at the end of every single webinar and I always mean to say it. Um, so basically, we put a statistical majority of 66% on our claims. There is no flat rule um, across every single um, platform. But yes, we always recommend at least a statistical majority. Now, the reason I say at least is because some platforms do have specific requirements. So in the UK, for um, Clearcast, who clear adverts to go on television, they require 70% as their threshold. So we need to make sure we're thinking about where the evidence is actually being used as well. Um, but, you know, generally, I would say 70% very good product, 80% excellent product, 90% outstanding product um, is kind of how I, how I give my own threshold as well. But yeah, generally, when we've got those, um, that appendix one, we, we flag up any claim that's achieved over 66% as being our um, substantiated claims. Um, how are aromatherapy claims regulated? So I actually have a whole webinar about essential oils, which you might find really interesting, um, which I can send over um, after this. If you remind me, I'm going to send out my contact information um, at the end of the webinar. Um, so just drop me an email, remind me, I'll send you the essential oils one, because um, it's, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting playing field. And that really does go into with aromatherapy specifically. Um, so yeah, there's no kind of blanket rule there, um, but there is more kind of detailed information in that webinar. So just drop me a message and I'll send that over. Um, so who challenges claims, consumers or advertising bodies? So as I mentioned, kind of, I don't know if you saw the sort of first bit about advertising regulation. So every advertising authority, um, you know that kind of goes across the world it can be a consumer or it can be a competitor that 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 will challenge your claims there are certain times where the advertising authorities themselves do do it so essentially complaints basis is the main one consumers or competitors complain to the advertising bodies about the claim and then they investigate it but there are times where um the sorry lose my train of thought there are times the advertising bodies will specifically go into um and to look into evidence as well i'm really explaining that poorly um but for example when i said about the microbiome um claim earlier they might then um spur on an investigation so who else is talking about microbiome um so it can be a bit of both but as a general rule it's going to be your consumers and it's going to be your competitors Another question about panel size as well. Again, I have actually a whole webinar about panel sizes. Um, so drop me a message and I will send that over to you because again, it's there's no set rule on panel size, but that webinar goes into how we make a decision about what panel size is appropriate. So that might be really helpful. Um, so another question here, loads of questions guys. I'm loving this by the way. Um, so thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is about making free from claims. I know they are not really acceptable in the EU, but I see brands that make alcohol free and aluminium free claims on their deodorants. Is that okay? Thanks. So generally when we're looking at it, it's, it's the free from territory is tricky. Um, I always recommend not to make claims about it anyway. Um, but there are certain things, like you said, alcohol free um, is generally to do with kind of especially irritants. So if they've got skin that is irritated by alcohol, which a lot of people do have, you can kind of say it because it's, you know, it's a bit like I have gluten free food. You can say that because there are people that have gluten deficiencies. So they need to know. Um, and it's the same with alcohol free. It might be that people um, don't, don't see alcohol products as well. Aluminium free is really interesting. I know that really relates to things like deodorant as well. Um, and again, it's to do with people having a preference. Um, so aluminium does a, because I don't really understand the science behind things. I'm really bad at explaining things, but it does have a long lasting effect. It has a buildup. So if people don't want that, they need to know about it as well. I would recommend in any case, if you're making a free from claim to seek some advice, um, the CTPA have a whole huge amount of resource about free from claims um so it's again specific to your product specific to your claims look at the overall messaging you're giving across are you denigrating the denigrating other products that have it in them or are you trying to show what your product is good at i always think about trying to show the positive rather than the negative 
Um, so what do you mean by insufficient claim data by Unilever, by the Unilever example? Well, I would recommend having a look at it. Um, so basically it was to do with, oh God, I'm going to need to get this right, but I'm really bad about science and everything like that. It was to do with, it was saying it was protected, it protects the skin's microbiome, but there wasn't enough evidence to say how it was protecting the skin's microbiome. Um, and actually it was to do again with how the skin's microbiome actually works scientifically. I would really recommend if you're interested in it, looking at the, um, ask if you just put in Unilever microbiome claim into Google um, you'll get some more information um, because of the top of my head I won't be able to go into too much detail with it um, but yeah it's a really interesting case um, I'm not sure what that one means I know you said about other brands like Nivea and Estee Lauder um, but if you want to know more about those um, cases just let me know um, so would a reformulated product, switching contract manufacturers, um, formula and inky list remaining the same, uh, require fresh claims testing? It's a really interesting um, question. So it does depend on what is changing. So as I said, this is common. Products change a lot. And it's almost not um, realistic to look at getting your claims refreshed every time there's a small change um, to your supply base, to your manufacturer. So we do um, what we look at. We do, we do actually provide a service where we look at formula concessions um, and signing off the data for them. So we look at whether it's likely to have a change. Now, switching contract manufacturers in particular, I would recommend actually doing a consumer study to assess that. A lot of our clients do. So you can look at your old formula against the new formula and making sure they compare exactly the same. It's kind of a good part of due diligence to make sure that you're happy with your new contract manufacturer and that they're, they're going to live up to those standards. So I actually would recommend it anyway. Um, but yeah, so it's really a case by case basis, though, when you're looking at anything changing about a product, um, do do have a do well, just do talk to us. If you've done the study with us, we can look at that previous data, look at what's changed. Um, you know, we've had things where fragrance has changed in product before, but actually the claims that we hold have got nothing to do with fragrance. It's not something that was analyzed. So even though they might have a slightly different ingredient that's doing the form, the form, the fragrance claim, um, so the fragrance, there's no claim on it. So we don't need to worry about it. Um, so that's just kind of my example there. Uh, gluten-free and cosmetics. Sorry, that was a really bad example because you wouldn't have gluten-free and in, um, cosmetics necessarily. Um, but I was just saying that, you know, as you have gluten-free food, because people have a gluten intolerance, you get a similar thing in cosmetics as well. Um, I've never seen a gluten-free cosmetic, um, so I'm not sure if that's a thing. <clears throat> Um, oh, so that's a, a very good point um, from Jeff as well to say that alcohol free can be relevant for religious reasons as, reasons as well. So halal products don't have alcohol in them um, to be halal certified. So that's a really good point. Um, so it can be to do with religious and cultural reasons and not just to do with kind of skin irritation as well. So again, we need to think about who our target consumer is, what are their needs and making sure we're communicating that across. Um, and does a product's final artwork have to be approved by an RP before packaging, printing? I would recommend getting your RP to approve it, absolutely. Um, so yeah, generally we do work with um, brands that will get their RP to approve the um, packaging designs as well. Um, I've just got one more question in as well. Um, and then I'm going to finish up the webinar because I'm aware that everyone will probably want to get off and carry on with their day. But thank you so much. Um, so the last question is from Heather um, saying, how do you determine the appropriate length of time for a skincare study? Well, that's all quite simple, really. Um, and again, it's to do with the, the, the claims that you want to make. So a lot of the time, we, we know when we work with a brand, they'll use formulations um, and they'll go, OK, fine. the reason we've used this ingredient is because there's evidence behind it that it can reduce wrinkles in four weeks. Well, our consumer study needs to reflect that and be four weeks long. Um, it could also be something like it cleanses the skin. Well, that doesn't need to be assessed over a lot of time. Just a few uses will be enough. It really depends on the product and the claims, to be honest, and the current evidence that you have. And again, that's really where I specialize. So if you've got any products that you're looking to test, um, I can look at all of your kind of overall like uh, wants for the product, what your overall claims are, what your product can actually achieve with the ingredients. And then we can come up with a study design around that as well. But amazing. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. So just before I go, I do want to say that we're very, very proud to be sponsoring the IFSCC Congress next year. And you can register your interest at their website now. So that'd be on the 19th to 22nd of September. And I hope to see you all there. 
I have a couple of upcoming webinars. So next week I'm doing making makeup advertising claims. So pretty much the same webinar, um, but we're looking at makeup examples in particular instead of skincare. And then on the 23rd of September, and this could be very interesting for those that were asking about aromatherapy, we'll be looking at a spotlight on wellness and emotive claims. Um, so that really comes into the aromatherapy realm as well. Um, I can see another question coming in and I will say, can you email it over um, because I will be able to um, answer any questions now um, via email. So there's my contact information. I will be set, put, sending you the recording after this um, and I'll have my email address on there and everything as well. But I just want to say a huge thank you all for joining today. And I hope that's been really informative and enjoyable. Um, and I hope you'll have a fantastic weekend. Thank you very much.